Okay, well, I want to say just like I'm so excited about, you know, following up on real stock because even if, you know, we never met, we hadn't talked. I think, you know, like a lot of the things that she said resonated with what I had to say. And uh, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So uh, the title of this is From ML for Astrophysics to ML for Climate, a journey across disciplines. So you would think that, you know, I've taken this journey. Actually, that's not the case. I've barely started. Also, ML will have a very limited role in this talk. So uh, the, you know, the context for this, and I want to tell you a bit of the story because this is something that perhaps may be of interest for others, is that uh, the Simons Foundation introduced last year, this fellowship is called the Pivot Fellowship. And the idea is that you know, it's for people who are actually you know, in a tenure track or tenure position, and they're interested in switching fields. And as we know, this is not an easy thing to do. So what they do is that they provide support by first supporting you for a year, which means that they pay your institution, so your institution is happy. And then, you know, like you need beforehand to choose a host lab and mentors, and the mentor or mentors they have to commit. Uh, to mentoring you actually, and they are paid of course for their time. And then they give you a possibility to apply for funding in the new discipline. And so I feel like it's a really unique opportunity. I'll tell you a bit about, you know, like how the idea came about for me, but I also want to point out that there is a new round of Pivot Fellowship application that is gonna open March 1st, and the deadline is May 15th. And so, you know, maybe something to think about. And you recognize actually, there's like Xavier Prochaska and Albion Lawrence, another physicist. And interestingly, all the three of us are going into climate or ocean. So it's uh, apparently a popular type of shift. So why did I think about it, you know? Uh, I guess that one thing that I want to point out is that, yeah. So sorry, so, so this program is, is really, I mean, it's like you're going to be outside five years and then come back or you really leave? Uh... No, it's one year. Like the, men, the fellowship here is one year and then you retain your academic position. So I'm going to stay at CUNY and, you know, I'm in a physics department. So actually this is like, you know, not as outrageous as if I were going, you know, a completely different discipline. So, you know, I expect that I will keep, you know, maybe like teaching some astronomy classes and machine learning classes, but maybe also thinking about something new. And then, yeah, you have an opportunity to apply for funding, which I think is important because clearly in one year, I think a reasonable goal is to figure out what you want to work on, but, you know, you're not going to be like competent or competitive for external funding, really. So, yeah. So for me, I felt like, uh, I don't know, something that I have accepted is the idea that, you know, serendipity can play a big role in our work life. I feel like this is something we accept for our private life, you know, like we accept the fact that we don't know, you know, when we will meet someone and fall in love and, you know, up and our lives for this. But somehow we work, I feel like, you know, we have this idea that it's like very deterministic and then, you know, you do step after step after step and then, you know, hopefully you'll get to the result. And for me, I found that the most significant steps, even in my professional life, has often been shaped by, you know, completely serendipitous events. For example, my second postdoc, which I did with Erika Weiser, I just want to acknowledge uh, the role that he has had in my career, because, you know, he took a risk with me, you know, I was coming from a very different field, and, you know, we had met completely by chance at uh, a conference and, you know, started bonding about these, like, terrible puns, as, you know, probably if you know the two of us, you're not surprised. Or, you know, the fact that I got my job at CUNY was mostly because, you know, like I sent the CV very late and, you know, I had work as a volunteer in correctional facilities. And, you know, I've been told this is like the one thing that made us, you know, like pick up your resume out of the pile. And, um, or I don't know, like I sent, you know, I spent <laughs> three years of my life writing this book, which should finally be out. But again, you know, like the reason why I sent the proposal was that, you know, I was sitting next to David Spurgel at lunch and he said, why don't you do that? And I was like, oh, so in a way, I found, you know, I got used to the fact that sometimes you don't need like, you know, this huge plan that has been going on for four years. So for me, I was a bit restless already. It happens to me every now and then. And then, you know, for the book, I had been reading a bunch of papers and like geophysics, remote sensing. I was like, oh, this is really cool. Then, of course, Twitter. So I first I saw uh, the ad for this lab that was open. It's called Leap. It's going to be my host uh, institution. And this is an NSF 
Science and Technology Center. It stands for Learning the Earth with Artificial Intelligence and Physics. And then I guess a couple of weeks after seeing this, I saw the call for proposals. And so I felt like this was like my perfect storm, but it's not something that, you know, I feel like it was perhaps brewing, but not something that had been in the making forever. So I want to say a couple of words about LEAP, especially because it's hosted at Columbia University. And so I think, you know, especially for local people, maybe it's something that you want to know. As I mentioned, it is a center that really tries to combine expertise in physics and artificial intelligence and sort of like try to tries to create a common community. They also have a commitment to broadening participation and education, which was something that especially with my CUNY appointment, I was particularly interested in. So uh, the way I went about this <laughs> was a very humbling process, you know, like in the um, no, it was called the press release about the opening of the center. They talked about the deputy director, Gail McKinley, and the director, Pierre Gentin. They are both, you know, like Gail comes from an oceanography background, and Pierre is uh, like more interested in like global circulation models and really every aspect of them. So, you know, they are very well known, very respected um, researchers. And so I had to write in you know, a cold email. And I was like, they're going to think I'm the retired engineer. You know, I was like trying to send something where I'm like, hey, would you like to be my mentor without, you know, sounding like a complete crazy. And even just setting the proposal, writing a proposal, it's, it's a very generic proposal, right? You know, they understand that you don't know anything yet. That's why you're doing this. But of course, you have to put together at least some ideas of things that are reasonable. And, you know, when you've been in the field for a long time, you're sort of used to be able to at least tell whether what you write makes sense. And I felt like in this case, I was just like, I had no idea. You know, I was like, I was reading my paragraph and it's like, and I was like, am I saying that I'm going to solve astrophysics, you know, the equivalent, or am I saying something that is like acceptable to a reader? So, you know, I, at some point I had to set pride aside and, you know, like email these very nice people that I had only met once saying, can you please check if this makes sense? So it was good. And just in general, you know, embracing the uncertainty that comes with waiting to see if this big change is coming was interesting. Uh, but I'm very excited. So I still don't know much about climate. I'll tell you a little bit about what I learned. And I think perhaps like the most significant thing here, is this like a thing you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, weird. Why does it go there? <laughs> I am so impressed. Okay, I'm not gonna use it. Sorry. <laughs> but, so that's okay. I think, you know. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yes, I like. I like this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as you can see, I'm very good with technology. Uh, so in general, I think, you know, climate has a lot in common with some of the problems that we talk about in astrophysics, right? I think uh, it is made of very, very many components, right? You know, you need to take into account the ocean and the atmosphere and the clouds and the land and the land use and buildings and volcanoes and all of these things. And also something interesting, it happens on a sphere. There's also like, you know, an interesting similarity. You have a multi-component problem, happens on a sphere. All these components interact with each other and feedback onto each other. Uh, a lot of their open problems come from a challenge about resolutions of models, right? You have things that happen on very small scales, you have things that happen on very large scales, and you have to uh, put them together. And this is tricky, both because it's difficult from a physical perspective and because it poses like a computational challenge. So I'm sure you're recognizing things that we deal with constantly and it relies heavily on simulations. In fact, I think that I have, you know, in my like very brief journey, I'm now convinced that climate is an even more complex problem than the universe is, believe it or not. 
And one of the reasons is that, you know, I mentioned the fact that, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, how to put together different scales, right? We can have like embodied simulations, they encompass the whole universe. We have hydrodynamical simulations in large boxes. We have smaller simulations that can create things like realistic galaxies. And somehow, I think we have a little bit easier job studying these different regimes. The problems with climate, I feel, are two. One is that you still have all of these scales that you have to take into account from like, you know, tiny thing on a scale of centimeter like aerosols to clouds and tornadoes and hurricanes and, uh, uh, you know, like cloud models, global weather models and general circulation models on Earth scales. Uh, and on top of that, you have a time variable, which exists for us also as well. But a lot of times we can do things in snapshots or in any case, the time scale of evolution, it's a slow time scale. And this is really not the case here. So each of the problem is not just on a different spatial scale, it's also in a different time grid. And then the other thing that I think is different is that we sometimes can actually study pieces in isolation we know that it's not correct, but it is generally correct. You know, to first approximation, it is correct. Something that I learned recently is that the biggest problem in circulation models, and when I'm saying the biggest problem, I'm saying the things that gives you the largest amount of scatter, even in basic predictions, such as when are we gonna get to that two degrees warmer? Is it gonna be 2035 or is it gonna be 2060? And this comes from these scales. So it's really hard in that case, you know, on the small scales, things like the clouds and aerosols. And so it's really hard in that case or small edits to, to say, okay, I'm gonna study the large scale independent of the small scales. Well, I feel like that in Astro, you know, the fact that, you know, things come from linear perturbation theory and, you know, we have this idea of like, you know, seeds growing uh, helps a little bit. Another thing that I've thought about in my work is, you know, like how to do, how to develop assessment metrics for a good models are. And I feel like this is also like, you know, a big thing in climate. For example, here you have like, one of these is like an actual earth satellite observations and the other ones are simulations. And you can see that they do pass a visual inspection, just like in this is like, you know, a set of interspersed real and simulated galaxies. We are at the point where we can generate things that are realistic. But then, you know, we still have the problem of like, okay, beyond the visual test, you know, what's a more rigorous way of assessing whether or not our models are realistic, both at the sample level and at the population level. And this is something that of course, you know, we, talk about a lot and you know we heard during this week a lot of uh, thoughts about this and they are also starting to think about so i feel like you know the nice part like i guess you know the nice point here is that there are a lot of opportunities for crosstalk between the communities right it can be scientific applications we can do modeling we have similar problems simulation based inference subgrading emulation development of metrics outlier detection detections equation discovery and this is just a few right we can also i think we have a lot to share in terms of community based practices i don't know much about this community yet i feel like it's also in a way a younger community right because i mean like scientists have been doing climate science for a long time but i feel like that you know it has really increased and you know welcome people from different backgrounds in the last decade or so uh, but you know i thought for example of climate bites like we have astro bites it wouldn't it be nice to have climate bites as a way of making you know climate more accessible uh even to uh, younger students and then in general of course i think climate is a booming job market and i think a fulfilling one right you know like i think uh, we know that we have a lot of students trained uh, in like astronomy and physics who may be considering leaving academic astronomy. And I feel like this could be like a really nice uh, field to consider as an alternative. So how can we do that? Well, this is, you know, going back to what we we're talking about uh, cross disciplinary research. I feel like that there is mostly from funding agencies, this chimera of cross-disciplinary research and how it happens that, you know, you have a person who's an expert in one domain, let's say that it's like astrophysics, 
and then a person who is an expert in another domain. And you know, like in the 2000s, we know when I sort of like started out my PhD in 2006, it was like statistics. We had to go and talk to the statisticians. Now, you know, now they call them data scientists, right? But it's like the same idea. The idea is like you take these two people who know about two different fields, you put them in the same room and they will talk and produce science. And I feel like that this is uh, very unrealistic and just, you know, I don't think it, it can work this way. So my, I don't know, somewhat controversial opinion is that there is no low hanging fruit in cross disciplinary research. I feel like that it has something that has a ton of potential, but it has something that I think really needs and deserve uh, resources. So I think, first of all, I believe that uh, you need an overlap of knowledge domains. I think it's okay if there is one person who's like, you know, more expert in one field and another person who is more expert in another field. But I think there needs to be an overlap. And in my opinion, this is not just a language barrier. I mean, this is a part of it, you know, the part, okay, you know, we call them variables, you call them features. I think, you know, it is one part, but I don't think it's the main part. I don't think it's just a matter of adjusting language. I think that, you know, as we know, a lot of times when we do science, we cannot do it blindly, right? You look at something, you're like, this looks weird. And you cannot say it looks weird if you don't know what you're talking about, what the expectation is. Now, I think this is the good part about collaborations, you know, like you only need like one person to be able to pick up every single detail. But I do think that, you know, like you need to be able to uh, spend time with the other community and build that domain, domain knowledge before you can do something meaningful. The other thing is that this interaction needs to be sustained and nurtured. Like sustained means that it takes time. And I feel like this is probably the thing that is hardest to do as we were mentioning, right? And nurture means that you need to have some meaningful mentorship. It's not something that happens just because of the act of being in the same room. Like you, I think you need to have some commitment in the other community to welcome you and to value your contributions and to uh, spend time teaching and you know, helping you understand. And so both of these things require money, right? You know, being able to spend time doing this and you know, having someone who is willing to help you uh, takes money. The other problem that again we mentioned is incentives, right? Like you, it's not just that you need to have resources for this, it's that people from both sides need to have a motivation. And this I feel like is even the trickier part. So I've had, I have an example from a previous pivot that I did. It was in Astro, right? So like a minor one. But as I mentioned, for my first postdoc, I was working mostly on like CMB, both from a theoretical perspective, I was doing modified gravity theory, like the sort of Jordan Brand sticky type, not Mon type. And then I was also part of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And so we were doing analysis of CMB data. And so I learned how to do these things there. Then for my second postdoc, I started to do spectral energy distribution fitting. And uh, I think it was interesting because in, you know, in this field, there were barely error bars on any plot. You know, you would only, you know, mostly people were doing sort of like, you know, like best fit through chi-square. So it was interesting because I could import some of the things that I had learned here. And, uh, you know, I wrote this um, MCMC ICD fitting code called GALMC, which of course was inspired by Cosmo MC. And it was the first public code. Not that this was like, you know, life changing work, but I think it was like honest work and, you know, like a meaningful contribution that came from a different community. So what's wrong with this? Nothing, but it took me two years, right? And I think I was lucky that Eric, that I was working with at the time, understood that it would take two years. It is something that is not common for a postdoc to be able to do, right? And of course, even to write this code, I had to learn all the different bits or at least some of the different bits that go into galaxy modeling. It's not something where I could have just said, ha ha, you know, here, let me build these architectures and everything works out. And this is, uh, I think, you know, the tricky problem. I feel like that there's a lot of potential in cross-disciplinary research, but you need adequate investment and even more, uh, you, you know, there, is, there should be an understanding that advances take time and are higher risk. And I think our system is not set up to reward those 
this is something that we said already and i don't know i think this is like the hardest piece to change right and you know this is also related to mark question how do i say to like a student or a postdoc to venture in something that is higher risk when you know that you know the expectation is that you have like a million papers on the same topic and so you've become the world leading expert on that one and this is usually what you're told that you need to find a permanent position and even later on right okay you know in many places to get tenure to get promotions you need to show that you have a lot of funding and a lot of papers and this usually you know it's much easier to do on something that you're already an expert of so again i don't have a solution but i think this is uh the main problem and it's something that you know if we want to do interdisciplinary research this is something that we have to have a, a, a big conversation about all right so for me for the next pivot again i'm sharing this uh mostly because i feel like it's been helpful for me uh, to use it as a framework to think about what I want to do. Um, I'm hoping to learn fundamentals of climate science. So, you know, creating this sort of domain knowledge. And I have sort of like a guaranteed sustain and nurture interaction for one year. Clearly, this is not enough. Um, so I think in the end, you know, the, this will depend on whether I find uh, a new community. But I think the last piece, you know, the third piece is uh, finding out what I want to do and what I can contribute to. And, you know, I don't want to be the person who does ML. I don't think, you know, anybody here wants that either. Um, so I think the third piece is really what can I bring to this field that is me. And I'm a bit obsessed with this diagram. Uh, I'm sure it comes from, it has a different origin, I don't know, but the first time I heard about it was from Dr. Jan Elizabeth Johnson, who was one of the co-hosts of the How to Save Planet podcast. I really like it. Sadly, it's been canceled a couple of months ago. And I think, you know, the idea here is to consider these three bubbles. One is what needs to be done. You know, you can think about it, what can be done, what's interesting, right? Maybe in research. One is what you're good at. And the third one is what brings you joy and try to work at the intersection of these three. So I've been thinking about this over and over and over. I have identified some things, you know, so this is my bring joy. This is what I can do or I'm good at. And I found these things. I love connecting people. I know a lot of people. So I think this is something useful that I could do. You know, if I also met people in the other community, I love when people say, you know, email me and say, hey, I'm trying to do this and can you help? And I can say, yes, this is another person you can talk to. I love solving simple problems with code. I have to say simple, you know, here I'm saying things where, you know, it's easy or possible to get insights, you know, like not too involved. And I love to work in small teams and, you know, co-advise and do these things. You know, I've abandoned like very large collaboration a long time ago. I just realized this is something that I can't, you know, it doesn't bring joy and I don't want to do it. Uh, there are other things that I could possibly do, like solve hard problems with code, but I feel like I've realized it only sparks joy. So I'm hoping to stay away from this. Writing grants, another thing I think I'm reasonably good. And you know, I didn't mind writing these proposals, but again, a long time ago, I stopped writing big grants because I just felt like the odds weren't worth it. And I was lucky to be in an institution where I could get away with it. And I also think I've, I'm reasonably good at communicating difficult concepts. And this, I feel like is right here at the, you know, at the margin. I think in some, in some contests, it does bring me joy. I like teaching and I like talking, but I don't like psychom usually i don't know so you know so but you know uh, there are also things that you know bring me joy but i cannot do such as these i keep them to myself but i think you know the big challenge is to understand you know i really have no idea where this is useful or can be done box will end up you know hopefully not there because there is no intersection but i think this would be the challenge all right sorry i think i guess i started also a little bit late right so let me finish with possibly the most useful part of the talk which is you know what we've been uh, thinking about if people are possibly thinking into a transition to climate science what you know what will be useful skills what are the most transferable skills and maybe what are the barriers and of course in this case you know as i told you i cannot really speak about that but i have asked people 
Uh, and so I've asked four brilliant people that I will introduce here. The first one is Kirsten Hall. Kirsten is currently a submillimeter array fellow at Harvard CFA. And she was one of the 2020 Schmidt Fellow. The Schmidt Fellowship is uh, a fellowship for a pivot that is like for people after, right after their PhD. It's a two year fellowship. So she was in the third cohort. And for her, the focus of her project was on atmospheric physics and remote sensing with the final goal to identify focus spots for a mission and pollutants, and perhaps, you know, an eye finally to policy. And now she had deferred her postdoc for this. And so now she's sort of like, you know, back uh, at CFA to finish up. But I think, you know, she's still very much hoping uh, to work somehow at the intersection of these. And, you know, she comes from a PhD in astrophysics at John Hopkins. She was actually a Toby Marriage student. Um, Second person, you you know, some of you uh, may know Chris. Uh, he is currently a postdoc in climate modeling at NYU. He is working with Laura Zanna and John Bruna, building pieces of climate models to account for different scales, as we were mentioning, using machine learning, and also a member of this M Square Alliance collaboration. He's a recent climate expert, and before that, he did a PhD in astrophysics at UCL, and then he was a postdoc at NYU, and also spending time here working with Shirley on uh, machine learning application in cosmology. Uh, the third person is Carol Lamb. Uh, she's an associate research scientist at Columbia University and also part of LEAP, my new institute. And she works at the intersection of observation and high resolution modeling. And in particular, she's trying to understand the role of aerosols and clouds in climate. And she's already a climate expert. She was at NOAA from 2016 when she got her PhD to 2021. But her background is in physics. She has a PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. And finally, Sarah Shemek. She is a postdoc, again, at Columbia University. And she's looking at machine learning for parameterization of turbulence fluxes and equation discovery. Already a climate expert, she did a master's in her system in Trieste, actually at ICDP, and then she did her PhD in climate science at the Cold Normal. Uh, but her bachelor and her first master's are actually in condensed matter physics. And so I asked them, okay, what's the essential domain knowledge that you need to have? So I don't know, what's your first guess? Actually, the first one is kind of a skill, but you know, this is what everybody was telling me. So again? Oh, programming. Okay. Other curiosity. That's yeah. This is like a bit more the main knowledge. I talk about skill, but it was partial differential <laughs> equations. <laughs> I was like, oh, I <laughs> see. Everybody was like, you know, this is this is the name of the game. Fair enough. <laughs> And then, you know, and then they mentioned things like geofluid dynamics, understand things like atmosphere and ocean, you know, a general understanding of how the different pieces of global circulation models work. And I have here, I don't know what happens. I don't actually, I don't, I realize I cannot actually click on the link, but maybe I'll, you know, I don't know if the slides are so. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Des. I forgot that you have this sort of like godlike powers. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so this is, you know, a course that they had a leap last year with the idea of putting together climate scientists and data scientists. And so it comes with a lot of like intro material. And so I figured this was like also a good resource to point, point out to. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, the second bit is, what are valuable skills the physicists have in climate? Now, this is a bit more of what we said you know, what we were talking about. What do you think will be the first one? We had programming, curiosity, what else? Modeling. Modeling, that's a good one. So I think, uh, you know, the biggest advantage here was the idea of thinking like a physicist, right? And I feel like sometimes we forget, you know, like they tell you, you know, study physics and then, you know, you can do everything. And, you know, it sounds like trite, but I think it's true. Because I think that it's true that it's like a very rigorous, uh, training in thinking about problems, right? And so I think the two aspects that came out were, you know, one being question driven, not like technique driven. It's not like, okay, I want to use ML for this, you know, but it's like, okay, what question am I asking? How am I going to go about it? And also the fact that perhaps, you know, even when you see a difficult problem, you have seen some of them before. 
And so you're you know, curious, perhaps, rather than intimidate. And other things where, in general, problem solving, and an important one that I think we also uh, think about a lot, like being able to think about what solution goes with what problem, reading papers, and sort of like at the end of this, the numerical skills. I just want to mention PDE again, <laughs> but you know, there was data visualization exploration and machine learning. And even if it was prominent, you know, in terms of like everyday research for many of these researchers, I feel like it was never mentioned as, you know, like the difficult bit or a barrier. And so this is just something that I want to emphasize. What were the barriers? I think, you know, this, uh, I don't know if there was really like a ranking, but I think in general, you know, the idea of being able to have, you know, like the commitment of the climate community to the success uh, was a big one. And time was the other big one, right? So, so in general, the availability of continued funding and the freedom to fail. Uh, the sheer complexity of the problem <laughs> was something was mentioned and, you know, by several of them and you know the recommendation was to be like okay don't try to do everything at once you know you can learn piecewise and maybe like the idea of a mentality shift i feel like you know we have all developed an idea of how it is that we go about problems and this is something that may change when we switch fields so the idea of you know like being open to you know like sort of leaving behind some of our schemes uh, was another one all right i think that this is it, more or less. So, uh, you know, from what I learned in, you know, this very beginning steps of this journey that I will properly start in the fall, is that I think that uh, I hope and I also expect that there will be strengthening connections between the climate community and the astronomy and physics community. And, you know, I'm scared, of course, about this, but also excited, you know, hope to find my spot in the Venn diagram. I really hope that in a few years I can be a person where, you know, if you're interested in doing this career transition, you can come to and I can help facilitate them. And I am very excited to showcase all the physicist talent uh, that make them qualified for careers in climate. And I should say that, you know, probably machine learning will not be one of these because, you know, I think it's useful. Uh, and you should also buy my book. Uh, I think it's here to stay, but you know, unlike everything else that you do, it's not rocket science. Thanks. Time for questions. Anyone? Leslie? So, giving advice to students like particularly PhD students who are interested in machine learning, there's a tendency to be kind of broad because, you know, it's a hammer and there's like a lot of nails. But like, is that a good idea like for their career and getting a postdoc? I mean, as you know, it's very difficult to be broader and to go from one topic to the other. And, you know, you've had such a successful career with this, but not everyone has that same story. So like, would you advise someone to do that? Or would you advise like a PhD student to be like, try to be a little more narrow until they become more stable in their career? Um, well, I guess this is very personal. And as you mentioned, you know, we are all shaped by our own experiences. So I am, you know, I'm a little hesitant, but I think for me, I would advise a PhD student to always be driven by a science, to be like, you know, to have a story to tell, which is a science driven story. And I think, you know, it's, I don't think, like, I feel like the, the technical part, the machine learning part is something that it's easy to learn. Now it has become a bit of a buzzword. And so I feel like, you know, if there is a chance to incorporate some of these in a project, I think it's a good thing to have. But to me, um, you know, the idea of like having a student and be like, okay, I'm interested in machine learning. I would probably think even for me personally, I don't know if this is a good match because I think really, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's a strength that we have, you know, like uh, that we can think about science. So as much as I love techniques and I've always been interested in techniques and maybe not driven by, you know, like a big overarching goal. I feel like that, you know, this is what we do, right? It is science. We do not build system. We answer questions.
Thank you very much, uh, Viviana, for the talk. Um, just a comment on this before I ask my question. Uh, machine learning can be science, and it's science. So <laughs> yeah. when you tell machine learning researchers, you know, we no, do science, no, you true. do technique. Yeah. You know. No, 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 yes, I don't want to me. I, I'm just saying maybe scientists. it's not like my science. <laughs> That's what I mean, yes, fair enough. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, in many of the examples, you sh these people you showed, you showed case, uh, lots of them are young. I mean, they did their PhD in physics, and then they transitioned for a postdoc, and yeah. which a postdoc could be seen as still, you know, you are learning. Let's say so. It's an early stage in your career, and it's yeah. you know, I see, I understand this switching at this stage. Now, long uh, later in your career, it's a different thing, and and so uh, I was wondering if you know you know more people that did that, you know. Uh, at, a later stage and and how the, you know i was wondering how they can contribute to the field and you know probably you're asking yourself these questions but you know i know if you know some other examples of this that successfully transition later on um i don't know many i think you know as we know i think that it is uh, uncommon because just because you know i think it's it's difficult and our reward system doesn't work that way. I know Sarah Bridal, right? You may remember her. She was like, you know, in cosmology for a long time. And I think now she does, she has like a successful company that does food science. And I think this was already like a faculty level. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, I'm sure there are names, but for sure there are few and far in between. So maybe Viana, along this line. So, I mean, this might be a war question, but once you are tenured, you cannot do whatever you want. I mean, it's, it's not maybe. Yes. Not maybe. Easy. No, no. I mean, it's. No. Yeah. No. I think it's a fair question. You mean like you know why do you need the structure to do what you want? Is the question? Like, could I, mean, I have done this without this pivot? Is. Uh, I mean. Or anybody. Why is not maybe easier at the faculty level to do this transition more oh. than maybe at the postdoc? Uh, I, I think I think because of um, what I was mentioning, even assuming that you know you're not interested, you know, like you are exhausted, the promotions that you want to go for, and you know, like you're okay not having students. I feel like that getting yourself to a place where you can do something meaningful, uh, I think it's really hard without mentorship in particular. And so I feel like this is, you know, I think clearly at the faculty level you have like job stability. And I think it's easier to say, okay, you know, I'm not going to apply for grants, right? But then, you know, like uh, around you, then you become like the only person that you're working with because, you know, switching to a new field and, you know, like writing a grant is something that, you know, is going to take a few years to build. This is not, but I think to me, it's really that, you know, learning something new, as we mentioned, is something that is difficult to do from a book. Right. And so in a way, you know, like showing up in a new community and saying, hey, I want to be part of this. I think it's possible, but it's hard. Right. Compared to having someone who wants to make meaningful introductions. So I think it's yeah, I think technically it's true. And, you know, maybe you can start from like collaborations, but I think collaborations are more likely to be like, OK, there is something that, you know, is maybe a technique and then the other person, the subject matter expert and maybe you do it. It's possible. I mean, there is a, like the astro statistics groups, I think that we have, uh, I can't remember the name of the association now. I think they've been like, you know, one successful group that has done this for years, like has been building community for many years, but I think it's not, yeah, you know, technically possible is not, uh, not easy. Yeah. Yeah, um, I wondered, uh, it's one thing to, it's interesting to talk about where we can go from the astro or astrophysics communities into other disciplines. I wonder if you see it as particularly difficult for people from other disciplines to come into our community and if there's other changes you think we should make to be more accessible in that way. Yes, I found that it's very difficult. I work, you know, because I work with a lot of these numerical techniques, I work with several students uh, like in statistics or computer science. And I think, you know, there's been especially like a couple of them that would have loved to join uh, astrophysics that, you know, maybe they've written papers, but they really struggled to find jobs. And I found that uh, the biggest uh, barrier wasn't necessarily like, you know, the subject matter knowledge, but this sort of like, you know, mentality shift. 
uh, this is at least my impression. This is what I was referring to when I was talking about the difference. I didn't mean to imply machine learning is not science. I'm just saying that for, you know, for our, you know, for astrophysics, I think that if you want to do machine learning and that's your main goal, maybe that's not the best match. So I found that, um, you know, the sort of mentality shift to be question driven rather than method driven uh, was, was hard. I don't know if, I mean, maybe we could be more understanding and more welcoming as a community, but I found that this is maybe something that is harder to shift later in your career. I, I don't know. I don't have many examples. Sure. So I think something I like have been thinking about a lot, like, like um, when I apply for like faculty jobs and how would I run my group. And, um, and I think like for the students, one can actually take advantages of like most of the universities now have like these data science initiatives where um, their mission is to help other faculty, like all the departments uh, like university wide things and they have seminars and they have talks. That's probably also true in like the statistics and the applied math departments. Um, so I think encouraging the students to attend these talks and like, because I think like if you talk about interdisciplinary science, right, you need to connect to people and interact with you and talk to them, right? And I think uh, pushing them to, to seek affiliation or to seek attending like these talks and um, interact with the other, like through the data science center in particular, um, I think might be useful to um, to start at least collaborating or joining and or even being aware, right? Because we are not really even aware what's going on in different projects and how we can connect them to what we do in astronomy. So, I, no, I think this is a, a great point. I think we definitely need to take advantage of this. I think my take is that maybe the burden of this is harder to put it on the student, but I think the way to do it is like, can two people co-advise a student? And I think this is, you know, like maybe something that has a higher chance of success. Because I feel like with some of the students to make the connections and then, you know, like there is in a way no incentive for, you know, members of the other community to mentor them and to welcome them. I think it's a bit harder, but I feel like if as a faculty member, we are the ones who reach out and say, hey, you know, can we think of a project that, you know, we can do together, then I think this is, yeah, something very promising. Uh, my question is more related to the previous question about like mentality shift. So is it just mentality shift or is it uh, also a difficulty because of all the background knowledge that one needs in physics in order to be able to apply it? That I mean, of on. course, it's everything. I just felt that, you know, my experience, I think, with the students that I've had was that that was harder. Somehow, I feel like, you know, like we are talking about, you know, obviously all smart people. And so, yes, catching up on the background, of course, is like a big effort. But I felt that, you know, even in interviews, for example, I felt that that the reason may be uh, they were having a hard time being chosen, even being, you know, very close was this, you know, like the just like the habit of thinking about, OK, this is a problem. What is that I'm asking? What is that I want to know? How am I going to get there? And this seems to be, you know, it may be just anecdotal and uh, like, I don't know, but this seems to be like a bigger obstacle in the experience that I've had. Any other question at all? Yes. This was an amazing talk, thank you. <laughs> thank um, you. Really quick question. Is there an archive in climate science? Huh. That's a good question. You know, I feel every time I you know I like, can look for a paper, I've never found like an archive version. So I want to say no, but I may actually be ignorant about this. Okay. I don't know if there's like the same, like the equivalent. Because I think thing. that's one of the things that helps us a lot in just a preprint server and an API. Yeah. Has been key for like my research wouldn't be the same without it. Yeah, no, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I feel like I'm also an institution that basically has zero access to any published journals. So, uh, okay, it's a very good point. Yes, and I want to say no, but I'll, I'll inquire more. Uh, and by formation, uh, Viviana, I mean, usually these people are physicists, are chemists. I mean, uh, what is their... It's a very good question. So, for example, Pierre comes also from a physics and engineering background, although, you know, started to work in climate quite early. I think some of them are like earth science 
departments and you know like earth science but then there is a, there are a lot of physics i feel like in, in like in this group i think about half of the people have somewhat of a physics background although i think the diversity of the community is also an interesting thing i feel like that now probably you see people from like different paths i think is what makes it vibrant but definitely uh, physics is a prominent component okay so if there are no more questions let's thank uh, viviana again thank you.